Alleluia. Glory to Jesus Christ, Yeshua HaMashiach, our Lord and Savior. We are in the Gospel of Luke, chapter 18. And he spake a parable unto them, to this end, that man ought always to pray and not to faint, saying, There was in a city a judge which feared not God, neither regarded man. And there was a widow in that city, and she came unto him, saying, Avenge me of mine adversary. And so the first thing we notice is that this widow, who is a vulnerable person in society, is standing up for her own self. We remember how in James chapter 1, verse 27, we are told about what true religion is. True religion is to help the orphan, the widow, and to be unspotted from the world. And therefore, we have this widow who should be the object of some sort of protection, having to stand for herself to come to court and ask reparation or ask for justice concerning a situation. We remember, brothers and sisters, also that in 1 Timothy chapter 5, verses 4 and following. But if any widow hath children or nephews, let them learn first to shew piety at home and to requite their parents, for that is good and acceptable before God. And therefore, the widow's children, her family, nephews, they're supposed to take care of the widow, and they're supposed to stand up for her and take care of her affairs. But if a widow is in court, it goes to show that this mechanism whereby we should care one for another has fallen apart. And it's a sad situation when a widow has to represent herself concerning her affairs to go to court because it seems that even outside of the courtroom, in the realm of the community that she's living in, she has been abandoned and left to herself to fend for herself. Where are the children? Where are the nephews? And why wasn't it possible for these matters to have been solved internally? Considering also that in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, we are told that we are judging those who are without. Should we not judge those who are within? And should we not make sure that we take care of our matters on the inside? But then it would come to the case scenario where we are told still in 1 Corinthians chapter 5 that we should suffer reproach and not go to court and try to get reparation. But it may be that she is involved in a dispute with an unbeliever. That's also a possibility. In which case, this is not the case scenario addressed in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, which is suggesting that two Christians do not go before unbelievers to settle their matters. And so still in 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 16, if any man or woman that believeth have widows, let them relieve them, and let not the church be charged, that it may relieve them that are widows indeed. And so this is again bringing forward the idea that widows have to be taken care of by those who are members of their surrounding family. And where there are difficulties doing that, then the church will intervene. But we're looking to the family of the widow first. Now, getting back to our story in Luke, Luke chapter 18. And he spake a parable unto them to this end, that man ought always to pray and not to faint. So let us remember this verse. We'll get back to it later when we get to the end of this parable. Verse 2, saying, There was in a city a judge, which feared not God, neither regarded men. And therefore this judge, who was given ability and the capacity to become a judge, feared not God, did not recognize that God gave him the ability to occupy the position that he is occupying, and he thinks that it is due to his own strength 
that he has accomplished everything that he has in life, and therefore he has become a judge unto himself, to then decree that his own opinion and his own concerns should govern his conduct. This judge fears not God, neither regards men. In other words, he has regards only for his own opinion and own self. Verse 3, and there was a widow in that city. And so there's a community there. The widow was a part of that community. And where we are supposed to be a body, there are people who have needs that are not being met, and they may be vulnerable. And yet, when we are supposed to have the mind of Christ, according to Philippians chapter 2, verse 5, and handle the affairs of others as though they were our own, hear this widow, a vulnerable person, a person who is supposed to be taken care of by her family, is left to stand by herself and fend for herself before a judge concerning a dispute. This is what we are to assume, given that we have indications that she should have been represented or helped by those who are family members and should have cared for her. Verse 3, And she came unto him, saying, Avenge me of mine adversary. At the same time, this woman, uh, who is desperate, obviously, tries to make flesh her arm. And the Bible teaches us in Jeremiah, I believe, 17.5, Cursed is he who makes flesh his arm. We are not to rest upon men when we have issues or problems because men will ultimately fail us because of their imperfections. And this is exactly what is happening here. Because as we will find out, this judge is not going to settle the dispute in a timely fashion. But conversely, at the same time, the Lord does tell us to use the authorities that he has established, because they have been established for our own good, to punish those who commit iniquity. And so on the one hand, she hasn't necessarily turned to the Lord, but on the other, she has done what the Lord has said in terms of using the authorities established on earth because they have been established on earth by the Lord for our good, and she has done that. And so this is Jeremiah 17, 5. Thus saith the Lord, Cursed be the man that trusteth in man and maketh flesh his arm, and whose heart departeth from the Lord. And if we turn to Romans 13, starting at verse 1, let every soul be subject unto the higher powers, for there is no power but of God. The powers that be are ordained of God. Whosoever therefore resisteth the power, resisteth the ordinance of God, and they that resist shall receive to themselves damnation. For rulers are not a terror to good works, but to the evil. Wilt thou then not be afraid of the power? Do that which is good, and thou shalt have praise of the same. For he is the minister of God to thee for good. But if thou do that which is evil, be afraid, for he beareth not the sword in vain. For he is the minister of God, a revenger to execute wrath upon him that doeth evil. And so from this perspective, the judge who is established in the judiciary branch in the legal system to render justice is supposed to be a minister of God who renders justice so that a revenge can be executed upon him that doeth evil and who is being brought to court over a dispute. And so this widow, she was hoping that the judge would be a minister of God and act in that capacity. But, unfortunately for the widow, the wisdom that this judge possesses is not the wisdom that comes from above, but the earthly wisdom which is anchored in the lusts of man. James chapter 3, verse 13. Who is a wise man and endued with knowledge among you? Let him shew out of a good conversation his works with meekness of wisdom. 
But if ye have bitter envying and strife in your hearts, glory not, and lie not against the truth. This wisdom descendeth not from above, but is earthly, sensual, devilish. For where envying and strife is, there is confusion and every evil work. But the wisdom that is from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, and easy to be entreated, full of mercy and good fruits, without partiality and without hypocrisy. And so a wise man endued with knowledge would render justice as he is supposed to, as an officer and minister of God, if there is a dispute and a widow has a valid claim. But this man, who did not regard God nor man, as we will find out, did not render justice for a while because he was not executing his function as a judge based on any morals or principles of God where there would be justice, where there would be judgment under the heavens, but rather he was simply fulfilling the lusts of his flesh, enjoying the position that he had after the desires of his heart. And we see this all over the earth in this world where people in high positions are doing everything but to care for the citizens that they are representing or caring for the citizens whose interests they are supposed to have at heart, unfortunately. Because, as the Bible says, this world is corrupt through lust. And lust here is a wide array of lusts which pertain ultimately to our flesh and the works of the flesh, as we learn from Galatians 5. And so we see that there is strife because this widow is trying to get justice and this judge is resisting that. There is strife, there is confusion. And so this wisdom does not descend from above, but is earthly, sensual, devilish, that is centered around man's arrogance, centered around man's lusts and own desires, their own justice, which is filthy rags. And very quickly, just to, again, outline the arrogance of a lot of people in this world who have high positions and who have a lot of responsibilities, they have the same mindset that the Edomites had in terms of thinking that they're in a high position and they cannot be touched. Remember in Obadiah, let's go to verse 3. The pride of thine heart hath deceived thee, thou that dwellest in the clefts of the rock, whose habitation is high, that saith in his heart, who shall bring me down to the ground? You see, judges in this world do not believe that they should be subject to other people when they are carnal. They even believe they are above the law. And they are thinking, who shall instruct me? Who shall correct me? I am the judge. I am the law. Forgetting that they are actually ministers of the Lord to execute the Lord's justice and judgment upon the earth. And that's the difference between the wisdom that comes from above, which connects your role on this earth to God as a servant. Because remember, the word says, even those who are masters on this earth have a master in heaven. Even the judge who is in a high position has a master in heaven. But when they deny that, and it is said that the judge doesn't regard God. So when he overlooks this aspect of serving God ultimately in his position as a judge, well, he now acts of his own strength, of his own accord, according to his own judgment and justice with the wisdom that is sensual. And he is thinking, therefore, in his mind, who shall bring me down to the ground? I am the law. Though thou exalt thyself as the eagle, and though thou set thy nest among the stars, thence will I bring thee down, saith the Lord. And this is a reminder of the Lord to these people who think they are in high places. He is the one who can take you down and will take you down from your high horses when you forget that you are ultimately a servant of the Almighty in whatsoever position he has set you. If we go to Habakkuk chapter 1. 
Verse 4, Therefore the law is slacked, and judgment doth never go forth, for the wicked doth compass about the righteous, therefore wrong judgment proceedeth. And so Habakkuk was actually accusing the Lord, saying, I see iniquity, and you, Lord, are standing by, and you're not doing anything. And Habakkuk is accusing the Lord of being an unrighteous judge, as we have one in Luke chapter 18. And this is interesting, because now the roles are reversed. Where this widow is looking at a human being who is being slack in his role of executing the law, Habakkuk, in his case, was actually turning the tables of the Lord and saying that he was the unrighteous judge. And we will find out in Luke chapter 18 that God will proclaim himself to be the righteous judge. Let's go to verse 13 in Habakkuk chapter 1 still. Thou art of purer eyes than to behold evil, and canst not look on iniquity. Wherefore lookest thou upon them that deal treacherously, and holdest thy tongue, when the wicked devoureth the man that is more righteous than he, and makest men as the fishes of the sea, as the creeping things that have no ruler over them? They take up all of them with the angle, they catch them in their net, and gather them in their drag. Therefore, they rejoice and are glad. And so you see here, Habakkuk is nonetheless recognizing that he knows in his heart that the Lord has pure eyes and does not behold evil, does not look on iniquity and accept that, but rather that he would actually stand up and defend the righteous. Habakkuk knows that in his heart. And so he knows the Lord would not hold his tongue when the wicked devours the man that is more righteous than he. And so Habakkuk knows that the Lord is the righteous judge, as the Lord will himself establish himself to be in Luke chapter 18. And rather, this verse 13 is representative of the judge, the unrighteous judge, who actually looked upon the cause of the widow and did not render justice for quite some time. And so it's interesting to have this analogy where the roles are reversed, where the Lord is being accused by Habakkuk, when in fact, uh, this would rather apply to the unrighteous judge and teach us that the Lord ultimately is the righteous judge. If we go to Micah chapter 3, verse 11, we read, The heads thereof judge for reward, and the priests thereof teach for hire, and the prophets thereof divine for money. Yet will they lean upon the Lord and say, Is not the Lord among us? None evil can come upon us. And so the heads thereof judge for reward. There is a situation where you have people who, being judges, execute their functions based on interest, self-interest, and rewards that they can get in connection with their work. And so they are not led by justice, but gain for themselves. And so we get back to Luke chapter 18. And he spake a parable unto them to this end, that man ought always to pray and not to faint, saying, There was in a city a judge which feared not God, neither regarded man. And there was a widow in that city, and she came unto him, saying, Avenge me of mine adversary. And he would not for a while, but afterward he said within himself, Though I fear not God, nor regard man, yet because this widow troubleth me, I will avenge her, lest by her continual coming she weary me. So we see the judge occupying a high function, as many in this world, and not caring about the representatives, not caring about the citizens, whom they are supposed to be working for, in terms of honoring their function and role in society as regards the Lord, and being ministers of the Lord in the capacity that they have, in the position that they have. And because this judge had the wisdom that is sensual, the earthly wisdom, and not the wisdom that comes from above, he did not honor the Lord. And he allowed this widow, who was a vulnerable person, seemingly not helped by her family members, to obtain justice. Whereas the Lord has set up governing authorities and courtrooms to settle matters and so that 
judgment would be found under the sun. And so the Lord, through his ministers on earth, officials, is supposed to have his will carried out. But where men have turned from serving the Lord and they serve their own lusts, then do we have this situation where justice is not being rendered and vulnerable individuals are suffering from this. We also saw how in Habakkuk, we had the tables turned on the Lord, where Habakkuk would challenge the Lord in demonstrating that the Lord was fair because he felt the Lord was being slacked. Whereas here in Luke chapter 18, we definitely have a judge who is unfair and the Lord says so himself. Let's go to verse six. And the Lord said, hear what the unjust judge saith. And so this unjust judge has been condemned by the Lord in that he is officially recognized as unjust. And this is that same judge whom we spoke about thinking highly of himself, perhaps thinking that in the position that he is occupying, who will bring him down to the ground? Well, the Lord has power to do that. Verse 7, And shall not God avenge his own elect, which cry day and night unto him, though he bear long with them? This is an important passage, and the Lord was pointing out this verse to me in the following terms. Though he bear long with them, you see, the Lord will avenge his own elect, which cry day and night unto him, though he bear long with them. And so the elect cry day and night. Remember in verse 1? I told you we would be getting back to verse 1. Concerning the fact that it is written that man ought always to pray and not to faint. And so, indeed, his elect are crying out to him day and night. They do not faint. They're always praying. They're always calling out to the Lord. And that's what they ought to do. Because the Lord says, cry unto me in the day of your affliction and I will deliver you. Psalm 50, verse 15. And so back to verse 7. And shall not God avenge his own elect, which cry day and night unto him, though he bear long with them? Did you catch that? Though he bear long with them, Meaning, the Lord is telling us here, it is not that I do not hear your cries, saints, but I want you to know that I hear them, but that I don't necessarily execute judgment speedily because I am patient and slow to anger. Remember, the Bible says that it is not that the Lord is slack concerning his promise, but rather that he would want all to come to repentance and be saved, although he has also told us that not everybody will believe. The Lord also tells us in the book of Ecclesiastes, because judgment is not rendered speedily, those who are evil have it in their heart to persist in iniquity, because the sentence of God is not executed speedily. So now we get back to Luke 18, chapter 7, and shall not God avenge his own elect, meaning of course he will, which cry day and night unto him. They've been crying out to him for a long time. They've been persistent and perseverant in prayer, as they should, though he bear long with them. And this is interesting because it tells us that the Lord is bearing long with us. He has heard our cries and he is suffering himself alongside us. And this is very important. Sometimes we open our mouths to say, Lord, haven't you heard my request? Lord, perhaps for you it is not such a great thing because you are the Almighty, but me, just a human, I cannot bear with this situation. But the Lord is saying, wait a minute, I am next to you. I bear long with you. I suffer when you suffer. You see, the Bible tells us we are one body, and when one member of the body suffers, the whole body suffers. And if Christ is our head, and we are the body. Then Christ suffers with us because he's part of the same body, though he be the head. And this is how he bears along with us. Remember in Acts chapter 9, when the Lord Jesus spoke to Saul, who would become Paul, he told him, why do you persecute me, Saul? 
When in fact, in 1 Timothy chapter 1 and Galatians chapter 1, it is said that Saul or Paul was persecuting saints. But then Jesus said, why do you persecute me? And so this is a confirmation, though he bear along with them. The Lord Jesus was being persecuted through the persecution of the saints. And so he was suffering alongside them. And when we have a request, and when we're crying day and night unto the Lord, let's not forget, he is suffering through the trial alongside us. And therefore, we should not murmur against the Lord. This is an important lesson. We have a tendency to do that. We are weak in our flesh, and we accuse the Lord. Though he is bearing along with us, though he is suffering alongside us, and he has heard our request, but he is slow to anger, and therefore he does not execute his judgment speedily upon the wicked. However, he tells us that in verse 8, I tell you that he will avenge them speedily. Now, this may seem to be a contradiction, but it's not, because in Habakkuk still, he tells Habakkuk, though it seems to tarry, it will not tarry. And so what this means is that according to our own understanding, when we're in a difficult situation, we would want an immediate remedy to the situation. But the Lord says he will avenge us speedily. But at the same time, we have to wait for it because he says we are crying unto him day and night and he bears long with us. So when he says he will avenge us speedily, we have to understand that it is speedy not speedy enough for us concerning our own weakness of our flesh who would want an immediate resolve, an immediate solution to the problem and action of the Lord. But the Lord is saying it will come in proper time. And though it seems to tarry, it will not tarry, as he says in Habakkuk. Because indeed, in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 7, and 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 12, we are told our faith must be tried. And this is by way of many tribulations and persecutions. Acts chapter 14, verse 22, it is by way of many tribulations that we shall enter into the kingdom. And the Lord also tells us, it is pleasant to him if we suffer unfairly and yet are able to bear it. This is pleasant unto the Lord. We go to 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 19. For this is thankworthy if a man for conscience toward God endure grief, suffering wrongfully. And this is another reason why he bears long with us, is because we actually have to go through the fire and be perfected by these trials, where we would want an immediate solution to our problems, but we sometimes have to cope with difficult situations over time because we're being perfected. So he will avenge us speedily meaning at the proper time. Remember John chapter 7, verse 6, your time is always good, but my time is not yet come. So the Lord will act on our behalf, and he will do so in a timely manner. But we must also account for the time that he allows us to be in the furnace to experience certain things. But he will act for us. And so I tell you that he will avenge them speedily. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man cometh, shall he find faith on earth. In other words, he's serving us a warning. I do come to your rescue, but where is your faith? Where is your faith that even though things seem to tarry, that you have belief and faith that it will not tarry? Where's your faith? In patience. In 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 6, we read, And to knowledge, temperance, and to temperance, patience, and to patience, we add, godliness. You see? And so patience is important because it leads to godliness. 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 6, again, And to knowledge, temperance, and to temperance, patience, and to patience, godliness. And we're talking about here in context about qualities that we must acquire and we go from one to the other, and we go from patience to godliness. And so this connects also into the story of Luke 18, 
When he says, shall he find faith on earth? We must be patient, even through our trials, and have faith that he will intervene. He says he will do so speedily, and so we must be patient. He's coming. He's going to do something. At the appropriate time, and depending on circumstances, it may be a little bit earlier or a little bit later, but he's going to do something in a timely fashion. And so this is the conclusion of the parable. Shall he find faith on earth? Meaning when he comes and there are great trials on earth, when there is a lot of problems and darkness in this world corrupt through lust, we who are saints, will we hold on and be patient for his coming? Will we manage to be patient and have confidence that our deliverer is on his way? He gives us assurance in verse 7 that he shall avenge his own elect for sure, who have cried day and night, meaning it has been a long time that they have been asking for deliverance. But he also justifies the waiting time by saying, I am also bearing along with you. I am also suffering alongside yourself. And therefore, do not think that I am doing this and it only has benefits for me because I also incur the suffering, you see, of you waiting to be delivered out of trouble because I bear along with you. And as we mentioned, Jesus confirmed that when the saints were being persecuted, he considered that he was being persecuted because he's part of the body being the head. And therefore, when one member suffers, all the members suffer. And so we have seen this parable, brothers and sisters, where we are instructed about many things, how the vulnerable are not being cared for properly in certain instances, and they have to fend for themselves. We have seen that this can represent in the faith believers who need to be supported by other believers, but may not find the support, may not find the help in their own families, in their own family of saints, in the body itself. And so sometimes this can be a bit disheartening. But at the same time, we are to turn to the Lord and trust in him. Now, we also read about this judge, these people in high places who have their own justice and think they are above the law and who act in a carnal way because they have not the wisdom that comes from above, but the wisdom of this world, which is sensual. And this brings them to forget that they are ministers of the Lord and they just want to have the advantages of occupying such a prestigious position and basically feed their own lusts their own arrogance and desires to elevate themselves in this world. But they forget one thing, the Lord can bring them down to the ground. And so let's be there for one another, just as the widow, her family members should have been there for her so that she should not have been as a vulnerable person fending for herself. This means there was a collapse in the community. There was a collapse in the body where a saint is left by himself where we are supposed to be members one of another and where we are supposed to have the mind of Christ to care one for another. And so she said, avenge me of mine adversary. And she sought justice uh, at the hands of another man. Unfortunately, in this corrupt world, we are disappointed most of the time with men. And so the Lord says, trust in me. Because indeed the judge did not for a while hear her, but then he acted upon the situation, but for personal motives, because he did not want to be bothered himself, but not because he cared for God or for justice, nor for man. And therefore, he was motivated by his self-interest. He had his own justice, yet is it filthy rags before the Lord. And he forgot that he was a minister of the Lord to execute judgment on earth on behalf of the Lord. Yet because this widow troubleth me, I will avenge her, lest by her continual coming she weary me. And so the Lord confirms that this judge is unjust. And we saw how in Habakkuk, sometimes we humans, we accuse the Lord of being slack and that his justice is unfair, but we should be careful because he is the righteous judge and not an unjust judge as we see here, uh, where there is a loveless judge 
who does not care about the affairs of the widow. Understanding her position as a vulnerable person, moreover. And so God gives us the assurance that he will avenge us, certainly, encouraging us to have faith and to pray without ceasing, as he tells us in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. Pray without ceasing. They cry day and night unto him, and he bears long with them, meaning he suffers alongside the saints. But they also have to go through some tribulations and persecutions and trials by which they are perfected. Because with patience comes godliness eventually, and we are to be perfected so that we are again in the image of the Lord and have his attributes. Verse 8, I tell you that he will avenge them speedily. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man cometh, shall he find faith on earth. And so don't worry, I will take care of the situation. I will solve the problem. I will execute judgment. And if a man fail to do it, I'll do it myself. However, show me the faith. Show me your faith, which is to be tried and be found more precious than gold and silver. Show me that faith. Because I clearly say that it has been a while since you have been crying, meaning that some time has gone by and I have been bearing along with you. So when I say that I will avenge you speedily, it also implies that I do so in a timely manner, yet allowing just a little bit of time to go by so you can be tested and tried. But I don't tempt you beyond that which ye are able. And so I will avenge you speedily in a timely manner. It seems to tarry, but it will not tarry. Meaning, the Lord does deliver us out of all our tribulations. As Paul said, out of all my problems, the Lord has delivered me of them all. But Paul did go through them and was perfected by each and every one of these trials. And so speedily, yes, but sometimes it seems to tarry for us, but it will not tarry. And it's part of our perfection. But we have an assurance that he will act. And he's saying, make sure you don't forget that I'm looking for faith. I'm looking for the belief, the hope that you have, despite a situation looking grim, that I will show up and be the deliverer, your rescuer. Alleluia. Because I am your shield and your exceeding confidence, as he told Abraham in the beginning, the father of our faith. So this is the parable of Luke 18, the unjust judge and the widow, and some of the thoughts that I wanted to share with you. May you all be blessed, brothers and sisters, be encouraged in the mighty name of Jesus Christ, Yoshua HaMashiach. And remember that we are not to murmur against the Lord, but rather understand that he is actually bearing long with us and suffering alongside us as we are waiting for our problems to be taken care of. And so he will act on our behalf and we are being perfected as we wait for him to stand up and take care of our problems. But he is bearing along with us so that we cannot turn on him and say, justice is slack or you're taking too much time. He is himself suffering alongside us. Let's never forget that. May you be blessed, brothers and sisters. Be encouraged. Hallelujah. Amen.